Hello friends, this is the second part of our two-part series on this Roland EP7 II digital piano. As we ended our last segment, um, Scooter had put a lot of uh, tracks all over this, which we're going to clean up magically in three, two, one. Well, the magic didn't work as well as I'd hoped, but at least it's better than it was. So, most of this video is going to be looking at the inside of this unit and trying to fix the problems. But we're going to cover a brief recap of, of the last video. Um, found a couple of bad keys that need to be dealt with that don't move at all. Another thing I discovered after I did the last video was that uh, I'd missed the record and play feature, which is what this piece button here is all about. It's one, two, three, and four, and it has nothing to do with the demo, which is why you heard the same demo song repeatedly in the last video. Uh, there's record and play. Another thing I didn't demo was the organ sound, so let's try that. So that's a pretty convincing organ sound. Um, it doesn't uh, you know, sound that great in the low end, but that's probably a limitation of the speakers. So, I've also connected the pedal to it to sustain. Let off the pedal. So that works as expected. I'll assume the soft feature also works. Um, so next we're going to turn it over, take out all the screws, and see what's inside. So I'll take all the screws out separately, not to waste your time, but um, you can see there's quite a few here. And it looks like uh, maybe these go to the chassis, and these kind of go to the top cover. So I'll proceed on that basis. So I've taken all the screws out along the edge here. It looks like there's a lip that holds it in here. And I found two slots that look like they're suitable for prying. So we'll try that. Well, it may be a longer operation than I thought, so we'll stop and I'll show you the end result. I believe I was looking at this wrong. I was thinking of the top lifting off the bottom, whereas it's actually the bottom lifting off the top. I think so. I took out all of these screws. And there's a little bit of adhesive here, but we'll find out what we've got. Voila! We've got these bits of something. That might be glip. It's supposed to hold the screws in, or that might be our offending material that makes the keys stick. It's almost like there's a whole can of pop involved here. we got these strange metal pieces at all angles. We'll take a quick look at the uh, interior in more detail later. Speaker, back side of the keyboard, more of these, probably spacers, I guess. Uh, another speaker, and our main PC board it looks like with all the major electronic components on it. Here's a big Roland chip, another Roland chip. So uh, that's kind of how it looks right now. And now in order to get all of this sort of pink goo out of here, uh, I'm going to assume that's some sort of fruit flavored pop. I'm tempted to taste it, but I don't know if that's a great idea. We'll see if I get that bold. But in any case, these are uh, clearly things to clean out here that shouldn't be there. My earlier idea that this was glip is just totally wrong. There, There's no rhyme or reason to where these spots fall and it seems to be sticky stuff that would stop the keys from moving. So in order to fix the key problems that this has we're probably going to have to take all of this out. Maybe as a starting step I'll figure out separately how to uh, dissolve this. It's really sticky semi-solid stuff, you know, dried pop would be exactly what you'd expect to yield this kind of stuff if you were looking for it. Uh, oh, this is interesting. This looks like the makings of a, 
I thought it was a wasp nest, but maybe it's just a big pile of dust. We see some corrosion here, which also suggests the liquid got into this somehow. I pulled off all those little rectangular spacers that I found and uh, dumped them in a tub of water overnight with the hope that the water would dissolve whatever it was that's on them. But as I handled them, I realized that uh, actually it has to some extent that surprises me um, anyway whatever this stuff is it's certainly not pop makes me glad I didn't taste it it has kind of a chemical petroleum smell looks like it does dissolve in water so that's a start maybe it's some sort of adhesive that they used it smells kind of like uh, epoxy, so I had a theory that it might have been uh, epoxy or maybe even with the pink color, uh, you know, transmission fluid or something. So, now that I know that it's water soluble, that makes the possibility of cleaning it off a lot, a lot uh, more likely. Uh, we'll do a little bit of kind of light scrubbing on these pieces and go from there. My best guess at this point is that the whole unit ended up overheated maybe in the sun in a hot car or something. All the um, adhesive they use on these pieces inside sort of melted and got spread around the unit and uh, you know now we've got all these problems of sticking keys which is really the big issue with this unit. Everything else seems to work just fine. I've set the lid back on top of it here so Scooter won't get into it. Here's something I noticed. Uh, this uh, sticky stuff in some places is in these rectangular spots. Uh, so maybe that suggests that uh, it really was the adhesive for all those. We've got a lot of spots to work with so I'm going to try different solvents on those. I can put that on this piece uh, out in the garage or something and not have to worry about melting plastic. Uh, if I just use water that'll be great, it'll solve the problem and uh, otherwise we'll have to go for some kind of stronger solvent. As you can see inside these keys there's a lot of this pink goop inside almost every key. So it looks like this whole thing's going to have to be taken apart to uh, clean out all the pink goop. So I'm going to leave the uh, cleaning of this to a separate video. That's probably more than we want to get into for this video. But let's take a look at our other components. We've got this main circuit board that has several chips that say Roland on them. Uh, you can imagine this must be the music channel generator. This appears to be the audio section with some conditioning capacitors, um, bypass capacitors. This has um, an external large wall pack power supply right over here in fact. So it uh, doesn't have a power supply per se in here but it certainly needs some sort of uh, conditioning capacitors to smooth things out in different spots. We've got our our phono jack inputs and outputs here. This is the the uh, tuning pot to let you change the pitch a little bit. We've got some connection boards. We've got two of these speakers, one on each side. Since we've got a single speaker for each channel we really can't expect to get a lot of uh, audio performance out of that. And another thing I noticed here was we've got two and a half ohms, which is kind of a non-standard value. Eight is normal. That's okay in a system for that's designed for that, but it reduces the reuse potential of these speakers outside the unit if I decide to scrap it. Uh, they're five watts each, which is seems about right for that size of speaker. So let's look at the keys next. We've got these three segments here that correspond to a set of keys. The smallest is linked to the middle and which has a ribbon cable that goes off on it and the uh, other one also has its own ribbon cable. 
these are diodes I'm pretty sure there's one diode for each key which is why you see such a large number of them here they're usually arranged in a uh, sort of a rectangular matrix of rows and columns so that are kind of scanned at high speed in a matrix formulation let's say this has uh, 77 keys that could be like you know to make the math simple seven rows and eleven columns or something like that they don't have to be exactly the same number and uh, that's just a simple way of organizing a lot of inputs uh, that can be read in a high-speed multiplex sense I've seen that on other computer keyboards it's kind of a standard technique we've also got some other little interface boards here of some kind those don't look like too much it's not sure what they're for maybe mounting or um, something like that we'll maybe know more when we take it apart now on the main processor board we've also got this CR 2032 coin cell battery which probably runs some sort of continuous small uh, size CMOS memory and in this era flash memory hadn't been invented yet and so maybe having some sort of extremely low power coin cell type uh, powered memory made sense you know you can imagine the coin cells probably dead by now might end up checking that especially if I end up reselling it so our options at this point are to uh, part it out or to uh, you know solve all the pink goo here I'm kind of on the fence about that honestly this unit may be worth more dead than alive uh, you could sell the main processor board separately the speakers the power pack and the big advantage of that from a sales point of view is that uh, you know you don't have to ship all this weight so we'll see what we come up with here That ends part two of our series on this Roland EP72 digital piano. Uh, in the next segment, we'll be taking the pieces further apart, looking at them more from the other side, and uh, determining how to remove the pink goo, or possibly just scrapping the whole thing if that doesn't make any sense. So as always, please remember to li like the video and uh, subscribe, and we'll see you in part three. Thanks for watching and bye bye.